Hey everybody, this is Phoenix Down, and welcome back to Let's Play Chrono Trigger. In the last episode, we defeated the not-so-great Ozzy and established peaceful relations between Medina and the rest of the world in 1000 AD. And in today's episode, we are going to continue the Faded Hour by tackling another side quest. So let's go over and talk to Ayla now. She's telling us that her village back in prehistoric times has a new defensive item, and we should check that out. You see, the Faded Hour, if I haven't already established this point, it's basically the part of the game where we're doing side quests that kind of tie up the loose ends of all the different party members' backstories and their own little story arcs and everything. You know, like how a frog came to terms with Cyrus's death and Magus confronted his henchmen over at Ozzy's fort last time. Ayla got the short end of the stick on this one. Her story is pretty much wrapped up. She's just along for the ride now. I know there was a, a dungeon in this game that was cut for whatever reason, I don't know if it was memory space or if they didn't think it'd fit in the story or they'd have to do a lot of extra work to make it fit, but there was a dungeon called the Singing Mountain, there's even a music track that's on the soundtrack and was actually used in the DS remake of the game and all that, and I believe that was supposed to be Ayla's dungeon for the Faded Hour, but for whatever reason it just didn't make it into the final version of the original game. So uh, instead of that, she has to just deal with having a new item to trade for. But uh, since uh, I feel so sorry for her, let's have her lead the group and, you know, Ayla, fight for world! So we'll put her at the head of the party, we'll listen to her rocking personal theme there and board the epoch. We're gonna return to prehistoric times to check out this new piece of defensive gear. So full speed ahead! Back! All the way to the distant past! Epoch go! And away we go! So back here in prehistoric times, the trading house now has a new item here. You can no longer get all those weapons that were there the last time we were back here before we uh, tackled the reptite lair, the uh, tyranno lair, sorry. So let's check out this Yoka hut. Even the uh, guy that was here before that tells you what's being traded is gone because all there is is just one piece of gear left. Made armor from many rubies. Ten each of petal, fang, horn, and feather for trade. So you need ten of each of the four tradable items to uh, get just one of these. But I've got enough for that, so let's make that trade. And we got the ruby armor, which is actually a pretty good piece of defensive gear. And uh, I would like more, but I don't have enough. I'm like short like two horns or something like that. But anyway, let's check out that ruby armor. Pretty good defensive boost there, and it cuts fire damage by 80%, which is really nice. Fire is the most common element in this game, so it definitely comes in handy. I'll give it to Ayla, why not? And since I'm here in prehistoric times, there's one other thing I'd like to do over here at the Luruba village, or the what's left of it anyway. All the people have evacuated from here, and they're living with the Yoka tribe now. They've kind of come together. So the place is abandoned, except for this sleeping new back here. So let's talk to him. Who disturbs my slumber? New? Just trying to get some shut eye. I'll change Ayla's name, so let me get some rest, new. So we basically have a naming way over here. Well, sort of like that. So you can rename your party members if you so choose. Maybe you named them in all caps or something and realized what a mistake that was. But anyway, the first time you talk to this guy, though, he also has a little extra something for you. I forget. No need for this stone, so I give to you. And we got the silver rock. This is one of five colored rocks that you can collect as accessories. These unlock different uh, triple techs that only uh, certain characters can use. So I'm going to go down here and just check this out. Let's go all the way down here where they... Okay, here's the silver rock. It invokes the triple tech spin strike. Click it twice and uh, Robo, Frog, and Ayla can use it. So if you have all three of those characters in your party, you give one of them this this uh, accessory and it unlocks this triple tech and then uh, we also had the black rock we got before so you know Marley Luca and Magus can do dark eternal with this one there's three others that we'll find later in the game I don't ever really use them myself it's you know triple techs are a bit overrated you know it's like you can probably do about the same amount of damage if the three characters acting independently doing their own thing anyway but sometimes they're pretty cool to see but anyway, these are the only ways that you can do triple techs without Chrono in the party, because everyone except for Magus learns a triple tech with Chrono naturally. It's just how it goes. But uh, 
But with these, you can actually do uh, use a uh, triple text with a different combination of party members, since at this point in the game, you can actually have parties without Chrono. But anyway, I think that covers all of this here. I'm going to meet you guys back at the end of time now, and we will begin our next real side quest. Alright, we're back at the end of time. Now I would like to talk to Luca, actually. It's a good thing we got that ruby armor, or at least it would be. But anyway, let's see what she, she has to say. Solar energy was used aeons ago, well before Lavos energy existed. It might be just the thing we need to defeat Lavos. And we're getting a visual cue, or clue, for uh, where uh, Luca's side quest goes. It's a place in the future. So I'm going to switch up the party, put Ayla back on the bench, and bring in Luca. She can lead the party for a change. So basically, we're going to be doing the Sunstone side quest in this game, in this uh, episode. So let's board the epoch once again. And we're going to head to the future. Back to the future. So basically, uh, it's time for action, Epoch. So we're gonna blast to the future, and uh, it's very close by to where we uh, appear. We're at the Keeper's Dome. If, Dome. if we go straight south, here's the island we need to go to. So let's land right here, and we're at the Sun Palace. You remember the Sun Palace was originally in the Kingdom of Zeal. It was one of those buildings on those little separate islands we could never get to. And uh, after uh, Zeal collapsed, it, I guess it was submerged for a long time, and then after the Day of Lavos, it must have somehow ro risen to the surface. But anyway, for the Sun Palace, we want to have a very special uh, setup for this. I want Luca wearing the Tabin suit, because of, uh, if you uh, remember, it boosts your fire defense. And uh, I got Magus and Robo equipped with the red mail and the red vest for a uh, fire elemental absorption. It's a very good idea to have both of them. This battle can be a pain if you're not prepared for a lot of fire elemental attacks. So let's enter the Sun Palace now. Well, the place looks a lot nicer than I expected it to for having been underwater for like over, you know, 1400 years or whatever. But anyway, what is that? It's time for an epic boss battle against the Sun of Sun. At least I say it's an epic boss battle, but it's more of a just a... It's only epic because of the music. This battle is more of a guessing game. I'm having Magus cast Ice 2 on the entire group of them, which is normally a bad idea, because the different, uh, because the Son of Sun will counterattack everything with Flare and cannot be hurt directly. But now all these other fire flames here will shoot fires at the person that attacked them, so Magus is being bombarded by a, a wave of counterattacks. I am following them with the cursor so I can tell which ones are doing the uh, counterattacking. The uh, top one did not counterattack. Oh wait, what the? Oh, they're all counterattacking here. That's not good. I wasn't expecting that. So, uh, but anyway, what happens is that the uh, the flames will cycle around and do a roulette shuffle eventually, and you have to pick the one flame that will not counterattack, and it will cause damage to the Son of Sun. I guess at the beginning of the battle, they're all bad. Either that or I wasn't paying close enough attention. Somehow I missed it. But when Magus' turn rolls around, I'm going to once again cast Ice 2. It doesn't really matter which spell it is. I'm just picking Ice 2 because it's water elemental against fire. It feels appropriate. So the Son of Sun will counterattack with Flare. It cannot be damaged by anything. I believe I've already said that. So let's, uh... I'm gonna follow it with the cursor and... Okay, here we go. That's the second flame right here. That one is the... that's the sweet spot. So once it's done counterattacking Magus, we're all going to bombard that one flame with... with everything we got. Just do physical attacks. It doesn't matter how much damage you cause the flames. It'll do roughly the same amount of damage to the Son of Sun each time. As you can see, we... we've chosen well. Now, if you want to bring in, like, Marley to do, like, flare... or... flare... Do haste or something like that to heal up the part or to speed up the party that might help. Anyway, I'm gonna have uh, Robo heal up Luca because uh, she's the only one that doesn't absorb fire attacks. And if the uh, the Son of Sun hits her with the amplifier thing, she's likely to fall to like the next flare spell. But anyway, the other way you can do this is if you just do process of elimination. Just have your party members attack each of the different flames one by one. If, until you get lucky. Sometimes it works faster than others. But alright, Magus, cast Ice 2 once again. 
And we're gonna follow the action closely. He's gonna counterattack with flare first, and then we'll monitor the different fireballs and see which one decides to go after us. Okay, that one's attacking. Oh, all right, it's, a, it's the same one again. So we're doing well here. We just have to wait for it to finish the round of counterattacks. I don't know what happened on that first round. I don't. Maybe maybe the battle starts off and they're all bad, and it's not until he does the first roulette shuffle that it changes. I don't. I don't know what happened there, but either that or I just happened to miss it and didn't have a chance to figure out the right one before it was too late. It doesn't matter at any rate. This battle is pretty easy. I have a theory. I don't know if this is true or not, but I believe that the Sun of Sun might actually have like HP sap already in effect on it for some reason. And uh, even if you weren't able to, say, defeat, you know, trigger, attack the correct uh, fireballs often enough, I think if you waited long enough, the Sun of Sun might actually expire on its own. I don't know for sure. I've never tested that. It, and I imagine it would take a really long time. So that's just kind of a theory I have. Oop, okay, well, he's shuffling again. So I'm going to wait for Megus to... Be ready for uh, Ice 2. It really doesn't matter which character as long as they can absorb fire damage. That's the important thing. And then we'll just watch these guys very carefully. We got the Flare spell. Robo's going to get healed back up. Luca will get a little bit of damage, but... Alright. It's the first one right there on the uh, on the uh, right-hand side. That's, that's the sweet spot now. So once again, just go through the wave of uh, flame counterattacks, and then we will... Bring this battle to a to a, a swift conclusion. It's just about over at this point. One or two more hits should do the trick. You'll get a caption on the screen that'll explain why or explain that the battle's winding down. No, it's not the flare caption. That's a different one. But all right, let's see. Yep, here we go. The sun of sun is losing its fire. Stand a little too close to the fire there, and it's going out. Or something like that. But anyway, after Robo does this attack, it'll be over. So you just stand pat and just just watch it kind of extinguish itself. And the flames have been defeated. And the battle is won! 3,800 experience points, not bad at all. 40 tech points, I'll take it. 2,000 G, not too bad. Megus leveled up. And we got some dual techs with Luca and Robo. Surprisingly, we haven't uh, had them together yet. The double the bomb. Okay. Not sure if that was a typo or not. So a couple du dual techs. We might see those sooner or later. But anyway, the Son of Sun flies back here and it happens to be the, the Ancient Sunstone. It doesn't seem to have an ounce of energy left in it. We could probably recharge it with sunlight, but that would take aeons. Who's got that kind of time? Oh, wait. We do. But we got the Moonstone. It's more or less useless, but there is a special place that we can go to, uh, basically, uh, you know, the people in Zeal kind of shoved it down our throats that if you left a Moonstone in the sunlight long enough, it could become a Sunstone again. So anyway, I'm going to travel back to the past once again. Go to prehistoric times. There is a place called the Sun Keep that we are going to be going to. It's uh, this little island on the northeastern corner of the world map. Let's fly all the way up here. Let's go this way and fly off to the east. I suppose it probably would have been faster if I'd gone west. But we got this island up here. And we've got the sun keep. It's the only place in the world where the sun never sets. I don't know how it actually works, but if we talk to this little sparkly here, it's never dark in here. So let's leave the Moonstone, we'll just set it there, and let's go back to the Epoch, and we'll just jump to the future and reap the rewards. Yeah, it took millions and millions of years to make it happen, but, you know, in the blink of an eye, we'll reap all the benefits. Instant gratification, right? Luca's so spoiled by the internet. But alright, we're here at the Sun Keep, somehow it survived the uh, Day of Lavos, it was close call, it looks like. But anyway, let's go in here and pick up our sunstone. Oh, wait, what? What the? It's, it's gone! The moonstone is gone! It looks like it's been gone for ages. Let's try another time period. 
So of somehow over the course of 65 million years or so, give or take, somebody uh, picked up the uh, charging moonstone and walked off with it. So let's go back into the past. I don't believe anybody would ever bother checking it out in the Dark Ages. You know, like most of the land, most of the world is underwater at this point. So uh, I'm going to check out the Middle Ages first. Dark Ages seems like it's, you know, we got other business there for another time. So let's check out the Sun Keep here. We go up this way and whoop, the Moonstone is still here. It's shining a little bit and we also, speaking of shining, we also got a power tab over here. Let's pick that up. I'll give that to like Ayla next time she's in the party, I think. Either her or Chrono. Probably Ayla though. So okay, well, wasn't 600 AD, so let's try a thousand. It's definitely not going to be the apocalypse, so this feels like, this feels about right. I've got a good feeling about this one. So let's land the epoch and enter the sun keep. And look at that, yep, it's gone. It isn't here either. I wonder if someone from this time period has taken it. It's very possible, Luca, but how are we supposed to figure this out? I mean, the world is huge. I mean, it's not like they're not going to post like a giant neon sign telling us that, you know, this is where the, the, you know, the moonstone is hiding. You know, it wouldn't be that obvious, would it? Oh. I wonder. Never mind then. We got the mayor's manor over here in the village of Poor. Poor A, however. I like calling it Poor. It's the mayor that likes to make you cluck like a chicken. Moonstone? Never heard of it. Oh. I'm suspicious. I suppose we could do something about that. I mean, we got a time machine. There's got to be something we could do to change his tone. Maybe we can bribe him with some nice jerky. So let's go to the snail stop and buy the best jerky in town. It's pretty pricey, but it's worth it. We are very hungry. Unfortunately, giving the, the mayor jerky won't do any good. In fact, he doesn't even ask for it. But there is another way around that. So let's uh, travel back to 600 AD. If you remember, there's actually a lady in this time period that was uh, asking about jerky. You know, if, oh, what a meal it could make, you know, she was really enthusiastic about it. So let's check out the Elder's house back in 600 AD and talk to this lady up here. I see you have some jerky. Will you sell it for 10,000 G? Now you could do this and make yourself a 100 G profit or a 1,000 G profit, whatever it was. But, uh, you know what? We're generous folks, so let's, let's just give it to her. You're giving it away? I thought there were no kind people left in this world. You can bet my children are going to learn the value of sharing. And, whoa, for a second I thought she was froze there. So she's ready to do some cooking, and we established a very, uh, a drastic change in her uh, natural timeline. Now let's go back to 1000 AD. You know, I feel like we're starting to get to the point where we're kind of abusing our uh, ability to time travel a little bit. Like, you know, I mean, you might think, you know, we're doing good things, you know, where's the harm in that? So let's go to the mayor's manor here. And, oh, look, it looks like something's changed drastically. The kids are uh, more friendly to their dad. She likes her dad the most. I love my daddy. You're interested in the moonstone? Well, someone simply left it here. Seems important to you, folks. Why don't you take it? And with that, he just... Hands over the Moonstone without a fuss. It's turned into a really nice guy. Share and share alike. Help the needy. Thinking about making that the town motto. Alright, well, hey, well, good good for you, man. The village of poor has changed its tune. And, of course, this lady's not satisfied no matter what you do. And the lady, there's the little kid up here says something different, too. I guess I might as well show that. Everyone thinks Dad's generous. Does that mean they think he's cool? Eh, who knows? Uh, it's it's better than the alternative, trust me. Although, again, like I was saying before, I feel like we're kind of abusing our time traveling capabilities at this point. You know, I mean, you could have just as easily just had like Ayla, Frog, and Magus, or maybe not, maybe not Frog, or maybe Robo, just break into the house, steal the Moonstone while they're sleeping, and you know, and just you know. I mean, it's the village of poor. I mean, what are they going to do about it, right? I mean, seriously. Eh, <laughs> uh, oh, anyway. Let's go back to the Sun Keep now. 
So over this way, I guess if I had traveled west, I probably got there faster. So let's drop off the moonstone and, uh, and just head back to the future and again, once again, reap the benefits of all this effort. A little bit of a detour there. There was a, a slight sec setback. We want to go to the future, not the past. And then we will pick up our newly powered sunstone. Hopefully this has been long enough, because we can't go any further into the future to take care of it, and uh, I'm surprised the sun would still be shining in here. Ooh, look at that bright flash. Amazing! With this much energy, I can make a powerful weapon! Let's go back to my house now. It figures the scientists are always about making the weapons. You know, you could power an entire city or entire planet for, like, generations with that much energy, but no, let's, let's make something that blows people up instead. I'll modify the sunstone to, to extract its energy. And then we'll just vacuum pack it into a cartridge. Make it sound so simple with your prehist- your- not prehistoric, but your primitive 1080 technology. Alright, so what'd you make, Luca? And it's finished! Let me do a little dance. Make a little love. Get down tonight. And we got the Wonder Shot. Luca's most powerful weapon in the game. Sometimes I amaze myself. She's modest, too. Take a look, Luca. I borrowed a bit of the sunstone to create something nifty. And we got the sunshades. Yeah. It's actually a pretty good accessory. It boosts your attack power drastically. So let's check out this new gear we got. We got the Wonder Shot. Look at that increase in your attack power. However, much like some of the weapons in, like, say, Super Mario RPG, like the Lazy Shell and the mash Masher Hammer, the damage varies. There's a randomness to it. Sometimes she'll do very, very little damage, but sometimes she'll do, like, you know, four digits worth of damage. It's, it's a little unpredictable, but ultimately it's the best thing you've got for Luka for physical attack. So let's equip that. And we'll take a quick look over at the uh, sunshades. It ups the attack power. I don't remember for sure, but I think it also boosts the power of your magic attacks. I could be wrong on that one. But it's best to give that to, say, Chrono or Ayla, somebody that does more of your physical attacks. It's, it is good on Luka as well. But anyway, guys, now that we finally uh, completed the uh, sunstone side quest, next time on Let's Play Chrono Trigger, I'm thinking about maybe checking out the, uh, the origins of machinery. Something like that. So this has been Phoenix Down, and I will see you guys next time.